people don't forget that stuff. They, they remember people that blow their minds, right? They won't, they won't necessarily remember the music. They won't, people won't remember the thing that you did, but they will remember the way they, that you make them feel, you know, whether that's by your actions or by the actual emotion that you've imparted to them via your music or your sound or whatever it happens to be. Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. This is the second part of my interview with Nick Morrison. How do you go about figuring out music for an audio brand? And and like I it doesn't I guess it doesn't need to be music as you've said there's a sound that you particularly like. Yeah. So audio branding is a whole umbrella of a bunch of things that are sound related. Yeah. Um and, and have you ever like done the whole audio brand for uh, a brand or do you just you participate not it's never just but yeah. do you you participate in the audio brand creation for from other companies that are spearheading it i guess yeah so i've kind of i've kind of done both mm -hmm. um you'll find that a lot of uh, audio production houses when they're getting when they're getting a contract usually what they're done what they're doing is they've got a contract specifically to produce a commercial or you know a, a whatever maybe a three minute spot or a, or a, a business thing or a sales pitch for the internet or whatever it happens to be but they're usually only getting one portion of that which is just that audio production piece. They'll usually have a brief where it will say, you know, needs to elicit feelings of vibrancy, youth, um, excitement, energy, whatever. They'll have a bunch of buzzwords that they'll put together. <laughs> sure. But usually what I find is that a lot of those companies that are doing that, uh, i.e. sending out the brief to the producers, the audio producers, the people coming up with that is actually the marketing house. Right. Um, at least in my experience. Yeah. They're not the audio branding people. And they're not really yeah. audio. They're just like, oh, this is what we need and this mm -hmm. is what it should say. And like what I remember working on a, on a commercial once and um, and I got the brief. And this was, again, sort of through a, like a friend of a friend. Somebody I had worked with knew me and went, oh, Nick's your guy. You should go contact him if you need this. And so I got this call, got the brief produced it, sent it over. And they were like, ah, this is great. Um, we need a couple tweaks here and I need, you know, three extra seconds and please uh, button the ending rather than having a fade out. Cool. No problem. But his last note, and this drove me crazy was, can you make it sound more purple? What? <laughs> yeah. Tell me what that means. Uh huh. Right. It means different things to different people. It means right? different things to different people. Now, of course, you know, you have to kind of take a guess as a, as a composer, as a producer, as a, as a musician, like, okay, well, what does he mean by purple? And so I asked a couple other sort of probing questions and I, and I ended up getting it down. Um, what he meant was he wanted to, to sound like purple haze by Jimi Hendrix, oh, right? which okay. was kind of the, which is kind of the, the vein that we had been going down anyway, but he, he really wanted to evoke that emotion for whatever reason. Um, but I find a lot of, a lot of the ad houses don't really think about music specifically in terms of the overall branding they think visually they think uh conceptually they think almost emotionally and then it's it's up to a lot of the independent um music creators or audio production houses to then sort of try and deliver something that works with them now what's gonna happen or what has been happening i've been seeing over the past five ten years has been the hiring of audio consultants to these marketing firms Ah, well, that'll help. Right. And I've done a little <laughs> bit of this. It, not a lot because, again, it's, you know, audio, unfortunately, is usually the very last thing that people think of. And the very Hence the reason for this podcast. <laughs> right? And it's usually yes. the last piece of the budget. They're like, you know, I'll, I'll talk yeah. to a client. I'm like, you know, what kind of budget are we working with? And they're like, oh, sorry, we, we've only got about 800 bucks left. And it's just yeah, like, we oh. already blew it somewhere else. Yeah. And you're like, OK, well, <laughs> yeah. do I want this project or uh -huh. do I want to hold on to my, you know, it, it, it's a whole that's a whole balancing act. And sure. that's business. And I don't think we need to get into that on, on this podcast. But <laughs> I um, think it's pretty obvious, actually. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, on those those. um marketing houses that are hiring people like this, you get a much more robust brief because these things are thought out beforehand because just like, and I mean, of course, I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's like just like colors and logos and looks, you know, filtration for your video and everything else, your sure. audio should also have 
all of those same kind of components in terms of a carry through, whether it's a single sound or a style or a, a voice, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to pair it with like a, an actual audible uh, singer, for example, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's a reason why flow from, um, whatever that Geico insurance is. Oh no, she's not Geico. Is it's it a, progressive? Progressive. Yeah. yeah but there's okay. a reason that she appears in the commercial and does all of the voiceovers because it's mm-hmm. that brand consistency sure, and it's yeah. that, that sound that we come to understand of her voice that is giving us that cue to do business with progressive because we trust them, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, as a voice actor, that's definitely part of the reason why I wanted to talk about this because mm inconsistency in at least the type of voice that you use yeah. <laughs> is uh can be a huge detriment to an audio brand so totally yeah um and and then sort of going along those lines as well what do you think the importance of good sound is i mean what does it do for a campaign huh, everything uh, I would agree. Yeah. So <laughs> but yes. <laughs> I mean, and of course, that's the the the, the trite answer, but it it really is a good audio, good sound, and you can take this as far as you want. And again, it, depending on how much money a client has, but if you're going to go for a full scope audio brand, it can really make or break a commercial, make or break a video, make or break a com- like any sort of usage. If you've got crappy audio, it turns people off. There is something about visuals. And I think it's just because of the development of, of the visual medium over the past hundred years or so, we've gotten used to seeing grainy video and uh, weird wonky video and video with lines. And, you know, we've all seen stock footage from the twenties that is black and white and jittery and whatever. And it's this sort of mixed media of a lot of storytellers, especially like in art house films where they'll cut together many different types of and kind of make it almost like a visual collage to tell a certain story because you're, you're looking to elicit emotions. The one thing that's never done that is sound. As we've progressed over the decades, sound has gotten better and better and better and better. Once you get better, you can't go back with audio. There's something in, a hum, in the human ear that if you hear poor quality audio, it immediately turns off your brain and you stop listening. Good point. So the visuals don't even matter. And it's interesting. There's a, um, an article and I'll, I'll provide the link for you. You can put it maybe in your show notes if listeners are interested. Sure. Um, there was a study done in 2012 um, and it was released in the Journal of Audio Engineering. And they basically came to the conclusion that your, your video can be not great, but your sound is good. People will enjoy the video, right? And this is talking about like online and um uh, stuff with like YouTube and again, commercials, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. But if the, the video is high quality and the audio sucks, you lose people. And it's, again, it's that thing that these producers and directors and whatnot, they just don't get it because they're used to working in this visual medium. They don't understand, they don't experience the world orally as we do. Um, and so, yeah, if it, it, it's a bit of an uphill battle, but once you get people to have that light bulb moment and you're the one that gives it to them, you can automatically charge you know, twice, three times, five times as much. <laughs> I was going to ask you how... Uh, so there's, there's the tidbit. Yeah, I was going to ask you uh, what suggestions you would have for musicians to make money these days. I think you just gave us one. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I mean, and that's exactly it. Like if, if, you, can, if you can look for... Um, and you can start local. You don't have to go to the internet and go worldwide. You can start local. There are audio production houses in every even mid-level, mid-tier city, if you want to call it that, like of, you know, 300 to 500,000 people, there's going to be at least two or three um, audio production houses. And even if there's not, I bet you the local radio station has one. And you can get involved with them. You can look at doing um, piece work at, you can do, um, you know, work for higher contracts, that kind of stuff. Then you can get out onto the internet at large and start looking at and pitching for internet jingles and um, commercial stuff and doing, you know, one of the one of the greatest things that's come along. And, uh, you know, you had mentioned that you're a narrator, so I'm sure you found, um, well, the one that I use because I do some book narration. I don't do a ton, but like ACX, right, Audio Creator Exchange for, sure, for Amazon yeah. or Audible. Mm-hmm. You know, there are places where you can go up and put your samples and you can, you know, pitch for work. Mm-hmm. And it makes it much, much easier. Um, the the better thing to do is to try through networking to find people that are associated, at least for me, and again, this is kind of coming from where I've come from, but is to get a hold of uh, somebody that works for a music, music licensing company, right? Or what's called a music library. Because 
if you build a good relationship with them and you provide high quality tracks, high quality um, music in any way, shape or form, and they'll take everything. Um, there are some that specialize in certain types and so on and so forth. But if you can find somebody like that, develop a great relationship, give them, you know, 10, 50, 100, 300, whatever, however many tracks and let them go and work it for you. It allows you to focus on the thing that you're good at, which is composition and writing and recording or building sounds or doing whatever you want to do. Um, and actually, oddly enough, one of the best performing placements I've ever had actually isn't music. Oh, no. It's been used specifically since 2009. It was a, and it was a sound effect. Oh, OK. <laughs> what was it a sound effect for? Um, it, it's like a sci-fi kind of like a door opening chime type sound, uh, based kind of on like Star Trek-y type stuff, okay. but it's been used consistently for more than a decade and I still get paid out on it. And it's, um, maybe not the most money I've ever made, but the most consistently performing. Wow. Um, so just kind of an interesting tidbit. Um, but that's what I would do is look at, you know, these music libraries and see if you can get involved with them. Um, I started in 2008 2009 doing like composition for film and television um i used a service called taxi which you may or may not be familiar with i know of taxi um, but they're, yeah, yeah. they're fantastic they are the world's largest uh individual privately held uh, a and r company that work with everybody from major label artists that are looking for songwriters to film and production houses looking for music and that's how i got my start and it's really cool um because i think i mentioned a little bit in terms about networking meeting people and whatever I can trace back probably 99% of my professional work has come from two contacts that I made because of taxi. Really? Yeah. Okay. So like, I'm a huge fan. I don't, I no longer subscribe to their service cause I don't need it, Sure. but that's the importance of networking and that's the importance Good place of, to start. It's a great yeah. place to start. And of course there is a membership fee and blah, blah, blah. We don't need to get into all that. I'm not here to sell anything. Yeah. Um, but you know, places like that can get you a lot further, faster than just trying to put your stuff on one of the numerous websites that are just a repository of the world's garbage. And that sounds harsh, but it's like a needle in a haystack, right? Because there's so much noise. So you have to have somebody on your side that, that pitches your stuff to people that will actually listen. Are you looking for ways to improve your company's or podcast's impact? You'd be surprised how powerful the use of an intentional audio branding strategy can be. Want to know more? I have a free downloadable PDF that gives you my five tips for implementing an intentional audio strategy at voiceoversandvocals.com slash audio dash branding dash strategy. That location does ask to put you on a mailing list just to send you updates on when the new podcasts come out. But if you really don't want to give your email out, I understand. Just contact me directly. My email is all over my website and I'll make sure you get that PDF without needing to sign up anywhere. If you do sign up though, you also get access to a resources section called The Studio, where I have videos, white papers and PDFs, discounts from my guests and snippets of audio from my guests that no one else gets to hear. So maybe it's worth your while, totally up to you. And of course, if you're looking for voiceovers, you can get in touch with me about that too. Now, back to the podcast. I think when we were chatting earlier, you had mentioned that you were doing some networking with filmmakers. Yeah, totally. How did that work for you? Well, so it, it, it's great that you bring this up because I think it's important too in terms of like if you're looking for ways to make money as a musician, ways to make money as a sound designer, ways to make, like whatever it happens to be, you need to network. Like Gene Simmons said, said it best, right? If you're not self-promoting, if you're not promoting your brand, nobody else is going to do it for you. Very true. Yep. Right. And I don't mean go be Uncle Nick at Thanksgiving dinner. Hey, guys, do you want to join Amway? I mean, you know, <laughs> please don't. <laughs> right. But you have to be self-aware of like you represent yourself because you are an independent contractor. You're an independent business. This is what I do. This is what I specialize in. And here's my business card or here's my contact information, whatever. Always ABC, always be carrying, I call it. Um, have some sort of information so people can find you. But networking with film uh, comp or excuse me, film directors is a really great place to be because you're going to find work, you're going to find experience, especially if you're just starting out, then it's definitely experience. But again, you're in a mid, you know, 300 to 500,000 uh, person town or city. I'm sure there's a college. I'm sure there's a university. I'm sure there's somebody that you can go that has a film department and they're making independent films. Now, are you going to make a ton of money? Probably not. Are you going to make any money? Maybe. I don't know. But you, you go and make connections with these independent filmmakers at the student level. And then as they grow up, if they're successful, 
they're going to remember you. Hey, Nick did a, did me a solid and, you know, composed that, that whole amazing soundtrack for my 20 minute student film. I'm going to give him a call now that I've got this hundred thousand dollar budget to make my indie film debut, you know, and you get work like that. But above that, and of course that's cause that's, you know, that's indie that's starting small. It's, it's networking, but sometimes oh, yeah. you get lucky and you meet the right person and you're at the right place at the right time. Voiceovers are the same way, actually. Cause I know a lot of people who will do, for instance, cartoon voices, animation voices, video right. game voices for people who are just starting out. Yeah. And then they, the people who they did it for, remember them when they're in their next yeah, job, especially, you know, <laughs> especially if you show up on time, Yep. you're clean, you smell nice, <laughs> you're pleasant, you know, to speak with mm -hmm. and hang out with. Um, and you do a good job. And it doesn't even need to be in person at this point. No, of course not. But again, <laughs> it's it's that, you know, being a, a good and easy person to work with, sure. delivering on time and, and not being a problematic diva, shall Definitely. we say, to, yes. to, to fling around the D word, right? Yes. Um, but, it, but it's true, you know, if you, any of my friends that are still touring and, and I can, you know, tell you firsthand, it's like the the biggest thing that music directors will look for, and you can use, you can substitute music director for uh, head of sound for director, film director or casting director or whatever. One of the biggest things that they look for beyond fit, do you have the skills to do the job? That's kind of number one. It's a no brainer, but the very next thing and often at the exact same level of, can you do the job is, are you a good hang? Like, are, are you, you cool fun to, to work with? with? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, if you're not fun to work with, mm -hmm. if you're a pain, if you're a diva, if you complain, you might get the job, but you're never going to get another job. That's a good point. And it's a small business. Yes. It's a yes, very it small is. business. <laughs> um, so getting back to the filmmaking thing, mm -hmm. but if you're, if you're lucky and you do end up with, um, you know, networking with one of these, whether it's a completely independent or maybe it's a small scale project, or maybe it's even a bigger project. If you have a relationship with them and it happens to come up in conversation like, oh, hey, I'm working on a new film, you know, I'm, I'm working on this scene and I just I, I, I need and again, different directors will, will say this differently, but they usually speak visually, you know, I need something to set the stage so that people can see the heartbreak that's going on. What they're really saying is I need some music to convey emotion. If you have a relationship with them and where you can say something like, oh, hey, I've got a great piece that probably will work for you. And you just slide them an MP3, you know, or a CD or a disc, you know, a thumb drive or something. And they use that in the cutting room as temporary music for their film. You have just ra radically increased the likelihood that your film will actually, your music, excuse me, will make the final cut. And you're actually going to have a payday. So why is that? Because directors cut to, for scenes that are important where the music matters, they cut to music. And they will cut and recut and edit and change and work with sometimes for a period of one month, two months, three months, six months, all the while using the temporary music that they've just selected because they're like, oh, I'm just going to use this for now until I find the right fit, quote unquote. But if they've spent that amount of time, like let's say it's six months, if they spent six months with your music in their poignant scene between the two lead characters, heart wrenching moment, tears are flowing, swells up or whatever. How likely do you think that by the time they get that scene finished and they're really 100% happy with it, the way it looks, the way it flows and whatever else, how likely do you think they're going to be to want to change the music out? Oh, very unlikely. Yes. They won't. <laughs> you know, I, I can, I can, I cannot even tell you the number of times I've lost out on placements where I've pitched for a film and they've loved my music. They've loved me. Again, they know me through the network, whatever. And they're like, hey, Nick, this is amazing. We love this piece of music. It's really great. But we're going to use the temp track that we've had again and again and mm -hmm. again and again. And that does not, and that's not to dissuade you from pitching for those jobs because you absolutely should. If you get, I have two rules, right? It's like, if I am, have a job offer or an opportunity that comes up, as long as it doesn't hurt me financially or embarrass myself or my family in some way, shape or form, I will say yes. Good policy. It's as simple as that. Sure. Say yes to as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And again, it gets back to that diva thing. <laughs> Right. Yeah. If you're easy to work with and people that are easy to work with say yes a lot. So if, if you can do that again, it just puts you in, in the forefront for those bigger jobs down the road. Mm -hmm. So you want to get in as early as possible. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, you know, you don't want to do this. You don't want to do this from like necessarily a self-serving point of view, because of course it is a little bit self-serving. Like if you, if you talk about, I don't know if you've spent any time in LA, but like, you know, there's this 
pervasive attitude of say yes to everything and everybody will always say yes nobody ever really means it yeah you know <laughs> but again it's getting back to that opportunity of saying yes and then actually following through if somebody asks you to do something and it just it blows people's minds when you actually follow through on a on a commitment that you make that is a good place to be oh, yeah <laughs> especially in that town but i mean but by and large you know the world over and it and it really goes a long way um and and people don't forget that stuff they they remember people that blow their minds right they won't they won't necessarily remember the music they won't people won't remember the thing that you did but they will remember the way they that you make them feel you know whether that's by your actions or by the actual emotion that you've imparted to them via your music or your sound or whatever it happens to be yeah that's a very good point there was one other thing that I wanted to sort of touch on before I, totally. I I sort of asked you what you're working on now, and that was that we had briefly spoken against uh, uh, we had briefly spoken about um, borrowing against your um, royalties. Mm. So um, just for musicians who are you know trying to buy a house or trying to you know fund some kind of business or something like that, yep. how do they go about? Um, borrowing against their royalties? That's a great question. Um, this is something that will work for probably only a select few, because if you only have a, um, let's call it an asset portfolio, because that's really what music licenses are, they're assets, um, just like an antique or your, ho or your house or, mm -hmm. you know, a, a stock. So let's say your portfolio of assets is, you know, 500 to a thousand dollars a month uh, or per quarter, you know, you're not really going to be able to do much with that. But if you've got a lot of placements where you're making 80 to 100 to 150 or $200,000 a year coming in through your royalty statements, and you can prove that that's an asset that you can sign against much like a life insurance policy or an RRSP account or your stocks or whatever it happens to be, you can take that to a bank and, and, and use that as proof and use it as collateral because it's an ongoing uh, paying asset, right? It's a, it, yeah. it's something that pays dividends quarterly. Before we go too much further, the RRSP is the retirement savings plan in Canada, just so yes, that- Yes, equivalent was, to the 401k yes, in the US. Yes, exactly. Just yeah. so people understand what we're talking about. And yeah. of course, I should put a caveat to this is I am not a financial planner, nor am I a banker, and this is not <laughs> financial advice. Mm -hmm. um, but no, it, it, it is something that you can do. And of course, in the US, it's it's more common, I think, than in Canada. Okay. Um, but it is it is something that's, that's there and available for folks, because again, it, it is that asset that you have that that pays out um, and again it can also help in terms of establishing your value uh, when you want to go out and get loans maybe you're not even using it as a as, as the collateral but you need to show proof of income um, it's not just the the dollar amounts that are coming in you know this month next month whatever else it's like well look I've got these royalties and they pay out year after year after year here's my last you know three five year three to five years worth of, of SOCAN statements or BMI ASCAP if you're in the states you know I've got consistent income yeah, yeah. So that is something that a bank will recognize as mm -hmm. uh, something to borrow against. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's it's um an interesting concept I think that maybe some people aren't paying too much attention to because it isn't money in hand at that yes. moment. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, and let's let's be completely honest, you know, most musicians are not super business savvy. <laughs> That this is true, yeah, right? you yeah. Know, and I can I can even speak for myself. I mean, I just been around a little while. I've been around the block a little bit, so mm -hmm. I know a few things. But uh, I'm by no means a money wizard. Um, but it, it it again, it's it's something that you don't know unless somebody tells you, or or you know, you've got an associate that's in the same field that says, "Hey, did you know?" Right? Or "Hey, this is how I did it." Well, there we go. We just said, "Hey, did you know?" Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> this is for all the musicians out there who thought that they could never get a house. <laughs> yeah. There you go. I know we're all dealing with a lot these days, so I really wanted to acknowledge those that have gone out of their way to leave an honest review of this podcast. Like Hazel, who writes, Great show, great selection of guests, and provides valuable insights about the sound industry. Thanks, Jody. Thanks so much for your kind words, Hazel. I'm really glad you're enjoying it. And for those of you that are interested, you can also leave a voice review now off of the main podcast page. It's super simple, and I'd love to hear what you think. Now, back to the show. What is it that you're working on right at this moment? So I still have my um, uh, film and television composition uh, business, which has really kind of slowed down a lot over the past three to five years. Um, I'm just not as active as I, as I once was. Um, I've built up a relatively um, stable portfolio now that I'm, I'm just 
being paid on those royalties that are um, continually being generated for me, which is nice. Um, but really the thrust of what I'm doing now is uh, the the guitar dojo because I, I'm at a point where I want to help others learn to play music, have fun again, make sure. music fun again. And so I'm working on uh, instructional books. Um, you know, I've got two out uh, already and they're on Amazon, one of which actually hit bestseller status twice last year, which is really cool. Feel free to and, talk um, about them and, and give URLs if you want to do that. Uh, yeah, I can I can send you the URLs and you can put them down in the um, uh, in the podcast description for sure. Um, one of it, and they're both very guitar specific, obviously, one of which is a uh, um, it's a really short book, but it's a really simple six step system, how to memorize all of the notes on the guitar fretboard, because it's it's one of the biggest sticking points for people learning guitar. Um, where you don't even really know what you're missing. Like if you don't do it, you never really think about it. But once you do it, you're like, oh man, I wish I'd done this earlier. So I've got a really simple system at six steps and literally 15 minutes a day for a week and you'll you'll get her done. Wow, okay. Which is great. Um, and then the other one, which I didn't really want to write, but my students said, this is what we want. This is what we need. And if anything, I'm there to serve them. So I said, okay. Um, and it's it's called Basic Music Theory for Guitarists. The, you know, simple plain English guide for beginning to intermediate guitar players. Everything that you need to know to be able to be musically literate mm -hmm. as a guitar player, but actually how it applies to guitar. Um, because the biggest problem that I've run into over kind of what we were it's almost bringing us all the way back full circle. <laughs> sure, yeah. One of the biggest problems that I find is that music is taught the same way as it was written down in the late 1700s. Classical music theory is really the stylistic specific rules around music creation in Germany in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, it's not super applicable to 2022 rock guitar, you know, <laughs> obviously there's point. carryover, <laughs> but there's different things that we look at as guitar players. And of course, again, it's the stylistic, you know, musings of that time, but it's also geared towards harpsichord. Why are we teaching guitar players music theory and how to play music based on the rules for teaching people how to play harpsichord? It doesn't make any sense. So this book breaks down a lot of that. And I've taken a lot of flack from, from people that are, um, in the education space and in sort of the guitar education space and say like, Hey, you're, you're doing this wrong and things are out of order and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, I know there's a reason for it. So that book's on Amazon. Um, I'm going to have another book <laughs> sure. coming out. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not at Liberty to discuss it just yet, but it'll be okay. out probably quarter two of, of 2022. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm getting ready to launch my guitar dojo app, which is a take in your pocket, uh, Nick in your pocket guitar lessons on the go. Um, what a great idea. Yeah. And it's tied into, you know, the website, the brand, the YouTube, because I provide free lessons on YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's a way that you can, or, or students, if they're interested, can support the channel and get, you know, individual lessons and stuff that's a little bit more in depth than things I can do on YouTube. Because if you get, if you get too heady, if you get too in depth with stuff, because really people are on, on YouTube for sort of edutainment, they're not yeah. really there for education, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, so if you get too in depth with stuff, you lose you lose viewers. So that's you know, hey, YouTube is here. It's free stuff. Please enjoy. You're going to take away some some cool tips and tricks. But if you want to get more in depth and actually learn some more meaty stuff, that's the that's the idea for the app. So that's the kind of stuff that I'm working on right now for 2022, and it's just a matter of um, building that out and finding and trying to help as many people as I can um, because it's. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And I, like I said, I'm on a mission because I think for too long, music has been taught with this very like hard edged brow down, you know, uh, sit in this with very rigid rules. And I'm like, no, let's make it fun. It's playing guitar. Um, and, yeah. and that's, that's the idea behind that. So. Well, thank you for doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, like I said, I still do music composition. I still do uh, consulting. Like I've got, so the, the two websites, I think I mentioned the one was guitardojo.ca. And then I've got morrisonmediagroup.com, which is my media consultancy slash composition. So if people want to get a hold of me for, you know, uh, consulting work, audio branding work, um, custom composition, that kind of stuff, they can find me there. So I'm always open for that, but I don't really do a lot of advertising or, um, what would you call lead generation or like um, mining for new business? Cause I just, I don't, thankfully I don't really need to anymore. So that kind of stuff usually comes to me through, through the network people I've worked with and, you know, opportunities come up and luckily I'm kind of at a place where I can go, yeah, I'm really excited about that. Or no, I'm not really excited about that, you know? And that's a, <laughs> that's a great place to be. So oh, yeah. yeah. 
Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective on all of this. I really appreciate it, Nick. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. It's been it's been a lot of fun. Hopefully your listeners got something interesting out of it. Oh, I think they will. Yeah. I definitely think they will. Maybe we'll do this again sometime. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we could come back in a year and do like a, a wrap up and be like, let you know how things are going <laughs> with the app and so well, forth. Well, join me on Clubhouse, actually. Yes, that's a there's a good plug for, for your Clubhouse, right? Yeah. Well, we have uh, discussions Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Nice. So, uh, yeah, you should definitely check it out. <laughs> I would. Yes, I would love to. I will keep an eye on the on the scheduling for that. And actually, one more thing on that note, I, I think I sure. feel like we're probably trying to wrap up, but <laughs> we're getting there. <laughs> one of yes. the other things that I would say, like, so whether you are, it's 2022, mm -hmm. we've got the internet and the world at our fingertips. There is no need to box yourself in to say, I am only this for that individual thing. So like for my, for my point of view, if I'm on YouTube and promoting guitardojo.ca. I am a guitar teacher. That's what I do. I don't talk about composition, or whatever else. If I'm talking about composition, I'm talking about audio branding, whatever else, Morrison Media Group, media consultancy. Cool. If I am film, whatever, you want to have a single uh, focus for the thing that you're doing, but have no fear or compunction about doing four or five or six or seven different things. Because it's all, again, it's all at the, at the end of the day, a bad day playing music or playing around with sound or doing the thing that you love is way, way better than having to go to get a job and sell cell phones for, Ver for Verizon or Virgin Wireless. Nothing <laughs> against those companies, right? <laughs> so have your yes. fingers in some pies, especially at the beginning, because you never know which pie or which income stream to use more sort of millennial internet speak. Um, you never know which stream is really going to pay off and become the one thing that suddenly is much, much, much more lucrative than everything else. And then when that happens, you double down and go, hey, you know what? It turns out I'm really good at this and I really love it. Mm -hmm. And I'm making more money than everything else I'm doing. Let's put all my eggs in this basket now and really go hard. Yeah. And once you do that and you go hard for two to five years, depending on what you're doing, you can probably set yourself up for the rest of your life, uh, at least with your career. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And it might even be faster than that. Because again, it's 2022, things move real quick now. <laughs> that is so true. Yes, things do move very fast. Yeah. <laughs> so nothing wrong with being multi-passionate. Mm -hmm. that a, that's a definitely a good thing to be doing nowadays, yeah. especially when there are so many different things you can have your fingers in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been a really great conversation. Absolutely. Thank you again for having me. And I would love to come back anytime you'd have me. And okay. we'll see you then if we do it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time.